When you're in a survival situation, you're normally thinking about shelter, water, food, and fire. These are like your four kind of key elements. And like maybe there's a storm coming in, or maybe there's predators that are going to try and attack you. And it was a Brazilian wandering spider. One of the side effects when it bites you is you get 24 hour erection. Where do I get these spiders? <laughs> Can you buy these spiders? <laughs> My name is Tom, and I'm a survival expert. Wilson. Tom, hello. Hello, Joe. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. It's quite a, a strange start because um, we met previous to this encounter um, in the toilet, didn't we? That's where I like to shake hands. Yeah, we did actually shake hands in <laughs> was the it, toilet. Was this a pre-arranged encounter or a, the toilet's in this building or somewhere else? The toilet's in this building and we were both at the sink and I was washing my hands and then I heard this voice said, oh, hi, Joe. And I went, hi. He said, I'm coming on your show. I went, oh, amazing. I'm Tom. I was like, oh, cool. Uh, my hands are wet. He was like, I like meeting in toilets. I was like, <laughs> We shake hands. So we did. We shook and my hands were wet. We shook hands. Had you, had you washed your hands with warm water and soap at this point? or Yes. Okay. Dripping wet. Actually, it was too wet, wasn't it? In many ways, it's the cleanest time for a handshake. I had seen you have a good wash there. Yes. So I felt confident. So it was good. Yeah. And <laughs> it was awkward. That's what I like. I like, I like this, Tom. He likes awkward. <laughs> we do have a problem, though, Joe, and it's a repeating problem. We have more guests called Tom. Mm. than any other name. Are you doing this on purpose because of your narcissism? It makes me feel better to have more people with my name in the room. Yeah. So what you're saying is we need to come up with a different name for you or Tom. Listen, I really like Tom in the very brief time we spent together. But the fact that he's usurped me as Tom on our podcast when we've been doing it for three and a half years <laughs> stings a little. Do you want to be T-Dog? I just want to be Tom. Oh, fucking. Okay, I'll call you Survival Tom. Is that okay, Tom? That's Survival okay, Tom. Joe. Right, survival, Tom. What sort of survival do you specialise in? Now, I know you didn't want to be called a survival expert. You're actually a... Well, I, I teach wilderness bushcraft. It's, it's basically primitive skills, so it's making things from our surroundings, from, from flora and fauna. Um, it's like base-level survival. So I, I actually focus in desert island survival. <gasps> I run a company called Desert Island Survival, and we take people to uninhabited islands and create castaway experiences. Whoa! Wilson! <laughs> like that? Just like that. You've got it. Have you ever had a castaway shout that at you? We've had many people bring the volleyball with the blood hand. Really? Yeah. And uh, you it now is. like fucking grow up. First time was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you say to them? <laughs> no, the customer's always right. I'm always like, oh, wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> Right. How did you get into this, Tom? Is it true, because this feels like an enormous jump, that you <clears throat> actually used to work in IT? I, I used to sell software in Maidenhead. Oof. And That's I, not a desert island, I was it? 27 years old, living in Maidenhead, and I felt like my soul was eroding every day. And, uh, and I was having pints with my mate Paul, and he was like, I'm walking to the North Pole. I was like, fuck, that's what I need. What, that's there? Right, th well, straight <laughs> after the pint? <laughs> He's going to have a pint just to settle his nerves. Yeah, and, and then off he goes. <laughs> north, off. Directly north from Maidenhead. And so um, and like, I trained for two years. I walked to the North Pole back in 2010. And then that was it. Like that Pandora's box was open. It was very hard to go back to Maidenhead selling software. Um, I met my wife. We moved to Chile. And the only job I could do in Chile was actually working in finance. So I found myself setting up pensions and huh. creating like investment funds for about seven years in, in Chile, also noticing my soul kind of diminish. And then I just was always dreaming about escaping the cubicle and um, I'm passionate about marine ecology. I wanted to go to parts of the world where humans have had almost no impact. And I wanted to see like perfect, pristine reefs and uh, tropical islands from bounty adverts. And so I just had this idea of like, can I, can I be a castaway? And I noticed like no one was really doing it. I found one small company doing it. I went on their trip and it really fell very short of what I was looking for. The, the guy was quite coarse, misogynistic and militant and he didn't really do primitive skills. He just brought like a flint and things. And I was like, and the island wasn't so good. It was infested with sandflies. Like, you're just getting bitten oh. every second. I could see lights on the horizon. I was like, if this was done 
with really perfect islands that are cast like kind of cut off from society and really like on point instructors it's been an amazing experience and so i was like all right let's do it set up are there actually any islands that are like that well this is the challenge so like to find i found three islands so far in seven years and looking for islands that are perfect for desert island survival it's like it's like looking for planets that can harbor life in the universe you're looking for this goldilocks zone of being close enough to tourism that we can at least get people in easily enough with transport you've got a nice hotel before and after that you're going to really enjoy after you've been marooned you've got a hospital in case of like injury and evac um but not not too close that you like break the illusion of of isolation so you don't want lights on the horizon you don't want boats coming past you want like pristine wilderness and so and that, that light sphere is always growing every year and uh, we're just about to lose our islands in Panama. It's been sold for $12 million and they're going to build a hotel on it. It's, it breaks my heart. Oh, I for love fuck's this island. Sake. I've been there, sat on the beach and seen like baby turtles popping out the sand and making their way to the ocean just as we're eating. And like swim in the phosphorescent plankton there. And yeah, soon it's just going to be another generic hotel. So yeah, it's always, it's hard to find these islands, but we sniff them out. <sighs> Joe, I can see from your expression that you are already fascinated. What would you be like on a desert island? Is this a dream for you? I really enjoyed Castaway. I really enjoyed the film Castaway. I loved it. But that was twofold. It was because I love Tom Hanks. And then the thought of a bit of peace and serenity really appeals to me. But only for so long. Because... The other side, and it's mainly why we do this show, the other side is the people fascinate me and the social side of human interaction I love, I thrive off, I love it. So then to not have that, I don't know, it's a, that sounds really bipolar, which probably mm. explains a lot, doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it? So I, I think I'd enjoy it for a little bit, but then I'd want to come home and I'd want to see people. And I'd also not enjoy it because I think I'd be really shit at surviving. Like, I don't know how to put like, pictures up that well, let alone... Not an issue on a desert island. No. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> practical skills. Yeah, practical. That's what I was meaning. I'd be shit. I'd be shit, let's be honest. What about you? Because looking at you, mate, I think I would survive longer because my body would have more to eat within itself. Even though I'd crave more, I'd it could burn off the fat and then the, the muscle and then muscle first, yeah, the muscle first, yeah. and then but you bag of bones. Maybe my calorific requirements would be lower though, Joe, so I could actually survive longer. Survival, Tom, thought. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's going to survive the longest? I mean, you've definitely got some timber. Uh, when I went into the wilderness to survive, I got as fat as possible. I I. Um, put on 20 I'm not saying fat Joe I'm just saying Oops. I put on <laughs> I put on fuck's sake it was, it was going well I put on 20 kilos three and a half stone in seven weeks by drinking coconut oil Did because you? you know calories are the money of nature you know and so um, you definitely want to have some timber if you're if you're going into a wilderness survival situation um, but yeah you're also your body is going to be hungrier every day so it, it's, it's a hard one to call right practical skills then which practical skills survival Tom in order of importance would Joe and I need to survive on a desert island? So when you're in a survival situation, you're normally thinking about shelter, water, food, and fire. These are like your four kind of key elements. And then the other element is psychology of survival. When you, when you start a survival situation, like let's say your plane went down or your boat went down and you're suddenly on this island, many people like, you know, you're, you're in a very heightened state, you're panicked. The best thing to do actually is nothing. You just sit there, you stop. And you draw breath, you try and get your heart under control and kind of um, and get some perspective and then think about, OK, what is my priority? Because some like maybe there's a storm coming in and this could be the only chance you're going to get rainwater for a while. Maybe you're going to suffer from exposure. So shelter and rainwater collection are going to be the first things that you're going to need to think about. Um, or maybe there's predators that are going to try and um, attack you. And so you need to start thinking about making a, a weapon or making a fire to, to keep them away. So it, it's very much changes depending on, on what situation you're in. Right, Joe. Let's say we have been shipwrecked. That yes. You and I have been shipwrecked on a desert island. With us, the ship has broken up on a reef. You and I have made it ashore. 
So we're marooned. We are marooned. We've been washed up with some red paint and some blue paint. The lid. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking shit. What's he done there then? I was. It's good though because I was going to say to you. Yeah. I don't understand why it's called marooned. I don't understand. But that's the paint situation's happened. Okay. We've also been washed ashore. There's some driftwood from the shattered hull. Mm. It's sodden, obviously, because it's coming in the surf. One of my favourite words. Okay. Um, we've got a crate of rum. Oh, yeah. Dead man's finger or Kraken? Your choice, because you, you basically you stop the pirate ship. Kraken. And we will have 5,000 litres <gasps> of ginger beer. Oh, superb. The the Jamaican one, you know, the, in the yeah, brown fiery. One. Yeah, you know okay. that one. And we'll, ha we'll have also had 10,000 limes. Wow. To make dark and stormies. And... Uh, 500 kilos of ice. <laughs> <laughs> this so sounds... that's what we're marooned with Okay, on this hot desert island, is it? So we need to drink these drinks pretty quickly because <clears throat> the ice is going. You get shit-faced for two weeks. No, Tom. See, that's where me and you differ here. So survival, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I wouldn't eat the ice. I would start creating small okay. craters in the sand and I would fill them with leaves like pad them out with leaves and then I would put like loads of them and then I'd get you to get all the ice and put them in all these holes what am I doing the ice what why am I doing all the lifting with the ice oh, I can't fucking do everything mate okay. <laughs> and so you're doing you'd, okay I'll help you and then we let that melt and then that's water Joe's absolutely spot on though I mean it's the place my, my mind went exactly the same way the most valuable thing you've got there is water wow so when you're in a survival situation talk about the rule of freeze which is three minutes without oxygen three days without water three weeks without food and so most people end up dying from dehydration and I, this was obviously quite an unusual survival situation mm. <laughs> but yeah you definitely want you need some containers you've got to have some way of capturing that ice I was thinking those paint tins straight away lovely containers it's going to be a bit tainted but um <laughs> One of the things on every single desert island, sadly, is several thousand plastic bottles. It's now what we, we have in modern survival uh, but, opportunities. But of course, but on this occasion, can, that's gonna we're actually happy that there's plastic rubbish there that's been washed ashore because yep. we'll use that, shall we? As our cups or, and or storage. Yeah, for storage, storage. there's water. For water. Oh, so <laughs> people in like sort of IKEA-style storage solutions. We'll get to that. Once we've, set, one, once we've settled in, then we'll do the furnishings. But it's all about survival to begin with. Do you know what I mean? So it's we've got our ice. <clears throat> of That's the rest now water. That's nice. The, the other thing I should have mentioned that got washed ashore with us, because it's a pirate ship, some remnants of the mainsail came with us. So there is some sodden canvas. I fucking love sodden canvases. <laughs> Honestly, I fucking love a sodden canvas. <laughs> <laughs> so be... we've captured our ice, which will become our water. What's <clears throat> our next... Important task, well, survival time. Sodden canvas is going to make a lovely shelter, isn't it? I mean, we could potentially make a hammock out of that as well. I think oh, yes. You know, sleep is critical. Without without good sleep, our mental health is going to fall off a cliff and we're going to start to make bad decisions. So um, we could use some of that for, well, we'd probably during the day use it for shade and, and during the night use that for a nice hammock, get us off the ground away from the creepy crawlies. But, but we, we would only use it for shade, not for uh, monsoon rain, because it would become sodden again, again and just make everything. It's better to use the the tree leaves from the bush yeah, around we... to create the shelter <laughs> that we're going to live in. Isn't yeah, we're going to weave some palms and we're going to make we? a lovely, lovely roof from those woven palms. We're going to stack them up deep so you have multiple ones on top of each other and shingle them. Shingle? Shingle. What is in the... Like shing shingling, like you see tiles on roof. Oh, I thought you not meant we caught shingles. Well, we've been on a pirate ship. It's not impossible. No, but uh, lime and salt stops shingles. Oh. Okay. <laughs> this is why I loaded up with limes. <laughs> and scurvy as well, of course. And scurvy. That's that's why they used to have so much salt. That's why they're called limeys. Limeys, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This is a fucking great time. I'm glad we're marooned <laughs> together. So we've got we've got our water from our ice. Our mainsail has given us shelter. Shade. 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 We've uh, built a shelter from the palm weaving. Fire. Yeah. So we're we're gonna have to make a friction fire. 
Um, it's not going to be easy because we don't have any cutting implement. We don't seem to have a knife with us. One of the things you notice on uh, Castaway is he opened one of those boxes and he got an ice skate. And that was ah, how yes. he got his Cut knife. his hand. That's, yeah. That was how Wilson was created, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, ja exactly. Jammed it on the rock and then... Psh. But we haven't got any ice skates on this pirate We don't ship. seem to have any, which is a shame because a cutting implement opens so many opportunities for us. Is there any way of making one? The best thing, I mean, you might find some flint or obsidian if you're very lucky, but normally clamshells on a, on a beach, you can break clamshells and you can get a, a rudimentary knife that way. Um, it's not going to be great, but all we need to do is find the right plant. And in this case, we're looking for beach hibiscus, which is it tends to be everywhere. And we're going to try and find a bit which is what's called standing deadwood. So it's it's completely brittle and um, and dry, but it hasn't got like rotten yet. And we're going to snap that off. And another piece, we're going to flatten it out and we're going to do a hand drill fire. You know, that classic. Um, mm. I, think he, I think it's, oh no, he does the fire plow actually, which is another one. I reckon you'd be good at fire plow. You've got the brawn. Fire plow? Which is where you get one piece of wood and another and you're just pushing it back and forth. Um, until oh, you, you get enough. I know, I knew your mind would go that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So we fire ploughed the shit out of this wood and it's it's sparked, is it? It's we've got an, we've got like an ember, which is like the end of a cigarette butt. And then um, you blow it. And and then, yeah, we need to put that into a tinder bundle, which is going to be, so the inside of coconuts, coconuts are incredible. We'll talk about all the wonderful things about coconuts. But um, inside there, even in a rainstorm, you can open up a coconut, you've got these fibers, and you're just going to separate those, make a little bird's nest, and you're going to transfer that ember into there. You're going to gently um, wrap it, and you're going to blow on it, add oxygen until this combusts, and then put the tinder on top and... Uh, kindling and off that must go. be quite satisfying when you've done like, you've done either that technique or the other or the, the other drill. one and you've got that timber what was it timber wool timber what was it called <laughs> tinder tinder tinder, tinder. The we're other... fucking shagging on the island are we <laughs> how are we getting signal that far out i thought we'd have marooned anyway so it's the tinder bundle hmm. it must be really satisfying when you've got that and you and then you see the smoke start to go and it really starts to catch yeah do you have that feeling of like, oh, fucking And it's did my it. favourite thing to vicariously enjoy of our castaway. It's like seeing people light up. There's something very primal within us, the satisfaction of making fire for the first time. Oh, I, do, I want to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do it? You're absolutely right, though, Survival Tom. It's just that point where it's almost there and it just goes... Mm. <laughs> Are you worried, <laughs> though, Joe, that when you're blown on it, you're there's a really fine line between feeding it just enough oxygen to... <laughs> And not so much that you blow it out. I haven't got the breath to blow it out, mate. That the technique you use there, just critique this for a survival. That seemed quite nice and quite gentle. So you sort of put your um, it's like a flautist. You put your lower lip out a little bit more, mm -hmm. and you tuck your top lip in a little bit, so you straighten it. Overbite. So it's a bit tight. You know what I mean? No, you don't bite, and you just so you don't give out. <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> Fuck it off. Do you know, like you see, <laughs> and then your jib goes all over and then phlegm it up because you want to keep your phlegm because your phlegm will help with calories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Surely, surely you then just. Every little helps. Okay, so we've got our fire. And then would you then, you transfer that to the the big stick of stuff you've done? Yeah, they say go from toothpicks to tree trunks. So you want to put the smallest, like almost like wisp of grass and very thin twigs. Again, you want to hear that snap, know that they're completely bone dry, and then you're going to put them on top. But in, preparation is key. You don't want to get this thing and be like, oh, fuck, I forgot to go and get the rest of the wood. You want to have all your kind of separate uh, kindling, tinder and fuel ready so you can then get this fire going. Because I've seen people, yeah, they get it and then they forgot to have oh. prepped beforehand after like two hours of... Of torment. So we've got our fire, Tom. We've got a fire, we've got our water, we've got our shelter. We're good. We're good to go. What else are we missing? No, that's mind. three. Hang on, that was three. The mind, Joe. You said what? You said there was a four, didn't there? There was food. Food. Yeah, we're going to need some Before food. Before the mind, we need food, of course. Before mind, it's food. Where? Where's the island we've landed on? Are this off the coast of Mozambique. Ah, mm. so there's some wild boar about. <laughs> Not on this island. There's some... There's some bird life, but they are easily spooked. Um, but remember, we were wrecked. Our ship was wrecked on a reef, which suggests there may be some aquatic life. Survival, Tom, help us. Well, that's where your most of your calories are. Well, coconuts are huge amounts of calories, but it's basically 98% saturated fat. But it's really good. Um, but yeah, aquatic life. So 
we don't have fishing equipment with us, do we? So we no. are going to be looking in the tide pools. We're going to be looking for uh, crabs and shellfish. Um, there might be some edible seaweed, which we can eat. Uh, we could also, you can actually just, what we've caught before, um, we've just sharpened sticks and we've managed to catch stingrays. Someone's caught a shark before, just, uh, just with a sharpened stick. What sort of legend? Um, Who is this legend? They need a name check. <laughs> that was a guy called James. Oh. Um, Humble yeah. name, extraordinary well, deeds. Well done, James. Um, so it's it's surprisingly possible just walking up and down the tide line with a bit of patience. If we if we catch ourselves a stingray, we've got one. Mm. We mm. can gut that, surely. Fillet it yeah. with our uh, shells that we've turned into primitive knives. Can I then chop it? Where's its barb? It's on the end of its tail, the barb, yeah. Right, so can we use its barb as a... Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't tie that to the end of a stick and, and use it, because they um, they do actually have barbs within them, like the end of a fish hook, so they'll keep fish on, um, and there's no reason why that wouldn't work. We, we've never done it. We it's like a mace. It's like a mace. <clears throat> we've had one guy get stung by a stingray about... 10 minutes after the expedition began. like He literally was unloading stuff from the boat and got a stingray to the foot. Um, but, so we had to put his foot in the hottest water possible and you keep on just making it hotter and hotter and that dissipates the venom. Wee on it? Uh, I wasn't on that trip, sadly. No. Oh, no. We should wee, you should wee on stuff. Oh, wee on it. I thought you said why you want it. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, wee, wee on it? You should wee on stuff. Yeah, that's for jellyfish stings. Oh. Yeah. I got stung by a jellyfish once. Did you piss on yourself? I thought it was a shark bite. Did you? <laughs> yeah, had a panic attack doing it. Did it was you, on one where, of those bobcats, you know, that thing that oh, takes yeah. you down. Like, where was this? Uh, Ibiza. Mm. And uh, I then felt this bite, what I thought was a shark bite, on my leg and panicked. I was half cut. <laughs> Zoomed back to the boat, got off. I was expecting like a big chunk out my leg. And I had these like, Three little blisters. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? I, was, I thought there was a shark out there, but it's. Uh, and then I looked round, and there was fucking hundreds of these <gasps> jellyfish that I hadn't realised were. I think, Joe, before we have a break for adverts, we need to talk about the mind. Ah, uh, uh, so we've had the big four. We've sorted the big four, sh which was sh shelter, water, food, fire. Big four, sorted. But the extra one, it should be big five because mm. surely this fifth one is, I would actually put as number one to get yourself, your head in the right frame of mind to attack the other four to begin with, but then also give yourself some sort of time to go, how are we, how are we getting through this? What are we, what are we going to do? Yeah. So tips for us on those mind survival tips. Well, so it really comes down to there's there's many different uh, traits, personality traits that make for people that do very well in survival situations. A big one is optimism, being being an optimist and believing that you're going to make it um, is very important. Um, Which one? <laughs> That's you. It probably is me, actually. Yeah, I think I'd have to keep putting an arm around your shoulder, early doors. I know. Am I going to be a burden? To you? No, you're not going to be a burden. Because we're going to work okay? as a team. Are you okay with being the, the optimist? That's fine. One? I mean, I'll have my bad days, and that's maybe where you'll yeah. reverse the roles and step in. Yeah, look, we should we should have some sort of communication technique with each other. Like, we give each other a percentage. You go, uh, uh, hey mate, I'm, I'm at I'm at a fifty today, and you go, don't worry about it, mate. I got the, I got the other fifty. I'm there. With, that's you nice. Know, or you go, I'm really struggling, mate. I'm at a twenty. It's all right. I'm going to pick it up with an eighty. And vice versa, you go, I've got 60 here. It's fine, I've got 50 in me. Having so got... resilience, being able to always find another gear is very important. Uh, having a lot of, of patience and self-compassion is pretty good mm, as well. As soon as you say self-compassion, I think you mean wanking. <laughs> and that's not what you mean, is it? <laughs> that's self-flagellation, isn't it? Okay. Um, Depends how hard you do it, I suppose, but yeah. <laughs> Self compassion. Like when I okay. yeah, when I was surviving um, in Canada on my own, the uh, I was always very conscious of the inner mind because I was totally on my own for over a month and, and needed to always you know the only person I was hanging out with was myself, and so I needed to yeah to be kind to myself and uh, yeah, it, it really helps. That's a massive challenge. It's a massive challenge to Tommy. Like you, 
you are you are clearly extraordinarily good at what you do. But for a lot of people, that idea of spending a month in very difficult conditions, even with one or two people, would be very difficult. But to do so by yourself. So how did you manage? In a way, it's easier than with people, isn't it? Um, because it's just you. Yeah, I I never really got lonely. I like my own company. Maybe I'm an only child. Uh, I I never really found the isolation a big deal. Um, kept myself busy all the time. Like every day, I would go out fishing for four hours. T you're talking about the uh, the mental aspect of it, and I actually entered a place where I felt the happiest I've ever felt in my life. Because th this kind of you know, we live for 99% of our existence as hunter-gatherers. You know, that's our genetic normal. What we, how we live now is actually very abnormal to how we evolved. And when you go back to this very simple state of being in nature and living simplicity, I, I just felt this wonderful, like, meditative state, this elated, like, happiness. Once, once I caught enough food, that was, and I had, like, all this smoked fish um, in, in my shelter, and I knew I had, like, money in the bank, effectively. I felt just incredible. And then also from... I think from eating this really clean diet out there of just literally living off roots and leaves and berries and fish and nothing else, my gut biome had this total reset. And again, like I think we make serotonin and things in, in the in the gut. And I, I started to feel like the happiest and healthiest I've ever felt in my life. Um, and so this became, I think, a flywheel. And I was also, again, like sleeping so well because there's no, no technology, no artificial light. So your circadian rhythm becomes very natural. Um, and so I, just all of this combined, I, I honestly, I wanted to be out there way longer. I was really quite pissed off when the TV show finished and I was told that I'd won because I wanted to do like another 20, 30 days. It sounds a bit arrogant. But um, <laughs> honestly, it's, uh, yeah. I, I don't know what it'd be like once I got really hungry and pushed up against my limits. You know, I'm sure I'd have wept. But, um, but yeah, honestly, it was really cathartic, really nice. Right, Joe. You're someone who's had their ups and downs in life. How would you find it to be on your own? For well, the, the way Survival Tom's just described that, I was like, I need a bit of that. And I've, I've experienced, or oh, I say I haven't, the only thing I can sort of relate it to is whenever I go sea bobbing. So I'll go down on, on a Sunday morning, either on my own or with my brother-in-law, and I'll get in the sea it started because I was chasing the cold water, the rush that you get on the, the back of it. Mm -hmm. But then it evolved into this sort of nature, losing myself in it. I'd look out at the sea and see nothing. It was just vast amounts of water. And I was like, fucking hell, this is really... Um, just put so much perspective and cal calmness on me where I was like, everything that was going around in my head just seemed insignificant and I just because I was just a tiny speck in, in the grand scheme of things and then if I'm a tiny speck which you called fat earlier by the way um and <laughs> if I'm a tiny speck then the the shit that's going on in my head is even smaller and insignificant yeah so then the way you just described being marooned on your own and because being happy with it, I was like, fuck, maybe I should try a bit more of that. Do you know what I mean? I think we all... With food. <coughs> I, I like the bit that you finished it with food. Yeah. I think we all need it, you know. We're so hyper-connected. You know, we've got a little mobile phone device that's constantly giving us dopamine. Even when we think we're resting, we're like, oh, yeah, I'd put on the telly or I listen to a podcast to go to sleep. We never really allow ourselves that downtime. Like, historically, we would always, you know, sit around the fire with that low light. Maybe you're finishing off the handle on your on your blade, you're whittling or whatever. And we, we allowed ourselves time for kind of more boredom and, and low stimulation. I think the brain apparently has, like, these two states of beta waves, which is when you're, like, uppy and doing things and busy um, or watching telly. And then alpha waves, which is if you're meditating, going for a walk in nature, maybe you're surfing or, or, or bobbing or whatever, like you're in that kind of flow state. And that alpha wave time apparently is really important for our brain. It's like a massage for our brain. It allows it to do repair and certain things. And we never really have that time anymore. No, we're just always on and hyper-connected. And when we have people on the desert island, I think it takes like three or four days and then they really feel like a change, a real big change. I think that, that time away from technology, that time in nature, they're just like, oh, I literally have nothing and I feel the happiest I've ever felt in my life. And, uh, I, you know, I think revisiting that is our more of our natural home than how we live now in our hyper comfortable way. It's, yeah, it's really, it's really beneficial. 
I think this. I think we we should do it, Tom. I think we should do it. I don't think we should do it together. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I don't. I think we. I think it could deepen our relationship even further. No. Okay, I got that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, have you ever been camping? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and where you've just fucked off, no phone, no nothing. You're just camping, and you're spending time with the people. I know it's different because you're still spending time, but most of the time when we go camping, we get round this fire, and we'd just go find loads of bits of wood, and we'd get a pen knife or a sharp knife, or whatever, and we'd just be sitting there sharpening these bits of wood. We'd fucking like tens, twenties of these bits of wood, doing nothing apart from that. And we'd, it would just be so calming and nice. And I just want to go find some wood now <laughs> with my knife. And do some whittling. I want to whittle some wood. It's another wanking euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> I was going somewhere and survival Tom is fucking bringing this pod down. I think we need to have a break to come back with some more professional questions. What do you think? Let's do it. So, I've got to be honest, you are looking magnificent today. What about you? You're looking lovely too. I wonder if it's anything to do with our new wardrobe from Hera. I think you might be right, Joe. Like, when you told me I needed a new wardrobe, I was slightly sceptical because it's really hard to find something that works for you, but also works for me. That's the thing though, mate. Hera offer good quality, attainable clothing. And whilst they do specialise in denim and comfortable sweats, they've got a wide range and versatile collection for both men and women. Well, that's good news. Mate, honestly, their stuff is great. It fits lovely, it looks great, and it's super comfy. Where can people find Hera, Joe? You can go and treat yourself to a brand new look at heraclothing.com. That is H-E-R-A clothing.com. Hey, you want a jumper as nice as mine? Go to heraclothing.com. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, man. I'm dancing like this because I feel so good. And I feel so good because I've got my hair of clothes on. If you want to feel as good as I do, look as good as I do in this Hera hoodie that I've got, go to heraclothing.com. Hera. 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 That's H E R A clothing.com. So, those were the adverts. I've got so many other questions here, Survival Tom. So many other questions. I would like to know about the animals that you have encountered on these islands. Because some will be friends, but some will be foes. Yeah. Let's talk about the foes. Okay. Yeah. I think I know one that's going to particularly interest you. So on our Panama Island, we, we didn't know this until about 15 expeditions there. Um, and someone got a nasty bite. And then we found the culprit. And uh, it was a Brazilian wandering spider, which is one of the most venomous spiders uh, there is. And it's quite aggressive. It puts its hind front legs up. It's, it's not, not a pleasant spider. How big? Oh, no. Um, best part of a fist. Fust. The interesting thing about the Brazilian wandering spider is that one of the side effects when it bites you is you get what's called priapism. Priapism is Ooh. a 24-hour erection that won't go away that's extremely painful. Hang on, hang on. So it's very painful, but you have a boner for 24 hours? Yeah. There's swings and roundabouts? Would you take that, Joe? You know, before the break, when I said <laughs> we'd come back out with more professional questions, we've tried, and the guest has taken us back to the gutter, and I fucking love it. Where do I get these spiders? <laughs> Can we've you had... buy these spiders? <laughs> How painful is painful? I, I mean, I'm, I haven't, I can't speak from uh, personal experience, but we've had two people that have been bitten. They said they, you know, they struggled to sleep the first, uh, first night. I mean, with tw no, twenty-four hour reaction, sleep is not your primary concern. I was actually having dinner the other night. Um, with a couple of friends and we were talking about she used to work in a A and E or was it A and E? Something to do with that. And how she her or her friend had experienced someone that came in with a engorged penis that it had for twenty four hours and I was like, well, what the fuck do you do with that? Like 
just chuck a load of ice on it or we're not wasting our ice by the way no no so can't <laughs> can't use that um and then she said no you have to make an incision oh, and, no. and drain it drain and you're it. like oh, what she's like well yeah because it's engorged from all the blood and thing and you have to drain it and then it gradually comes down so survival time if that happens again uh just get some of that are there any shells in Panama? <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll have knives and scuffles. Oh, you've got Don't knives. Worry. Okay, you just we'll we'll, we'll come at the uh, the castaway. How do you explain that to a, a guest who's presumably paying a decent fee that you're going to take a scalpel to their penis? But definitely not. <laughs> to their penis. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, what should we move on? Oh, other so animals. Are there oh, any yeah, other animal so, counters? Yeah. Um, I mean, we have a in Tonga. We have a, a giant centipede called a malocca, which also gives it excruciating. How giant a centipede uh, is best this? Best part of a foot. A foot long centipede. Yeah. But I mean, generally we choose islands that don't have deadly animals, um, and so the, these. So we we avoid anywhere that has uh, venomous snakes, um, but there are always you know a few. A few nasty. What can that centipede do to you? It's just excruciatingly painful. Just. Yeah, and it can be a bit aggressive, apparently. So it'll, just, <laughs> it'll come at you. Yeah, it, it, it'll be, you'll be sleeping, and it'll be like, I'll have none of that, <laughs> and, and have a little bite. H hence the hammock. Yeah, yeah, so you want to be off the ground. What about the scuttlers? Are the scuttlers creepy crawlies? Other ones we need to worry about. Yeah. And uh, we've got scorpions. Um, we've had a few people. But then generally not too bad. I mean, we don't, we don't have the, the highly toxic scorpions. That's about it, really. Like, there's not, not nothing else too scuttly to worry about. So, aside from the spider bite, yeah, and the barb of one of your castaways getting barbed, any other had, accidents? Yeah, we've had two more evacuations. Um, one guy managed to put a fish hook for his finger past the barb, and we offered to cut the eyelet off and take it out for him, but he he preferred to go to the clinic and get that done. And then the other one was um, this twat sat opposite you. Um, was on my very, uh, was on my third ever trip. I was um, running it on my own. We always have two instructors, but I was bootstrapping the business right at the beginning, and I was running a solo expedition. I had these eight uh, Danish entrepreneurs, and the very first night, I had this torrential rainstorm, and I was like, oh shit, the shelter's not. Um, it's letting in water, so I was like, okay, we need to split some wood. Got my freshly sharpened machete and started batoning down and splitting wood. And my hand in the rain slipped off the handle and cut straight through my flexor tendon on my finger. Um, and I realised straight away I'd, I'd done a nasty, um, nasty cut. It won't go straight. Fuck, what's wrong with your finger? <laughs> it won't go straight anymore because I cut the tendon. And um, so, yeah, I had to go and get that one stitched up and then come back and, and run the expedition. And I remember doing a, a bow drill fire demonstration the next day. I was like, it was killing, but and then I felt it pop and open up, <laughs> and the blood was <laughs> dripping off my elbow. Um, and I was like, "Don't put the fire out; must stoically continue." And that was <sighs> honestly like the, the deepest I've had to dig, like to carry on with that trip. But um, how many trips have you done in all? Uh, as a company, we've done like best part of a hundred. I've probably done like twenty or fifteen or twenty or so. Well, considering like the amount you've done, chopping your tendon figures, yeah, not bad going, no. Yeah, just what well, just the one digit maimed. I also feel here, Joe, when we've been, not negative, but we've looked at some of the downsides. Let's talk upsides, survival, Tom. If you are out there on these islands, like you said, there's no light pollution, there are no passing ships. Like, How wonderful does it become? It really, I mean, I was talking about how good it is for our mental health. It, for, for me, it really is magic to to get so up close to nature. Um, for, or to be in the domain of, of these animals is, is something that's wonderful about it. Every expedition the island gives up secrets that we we may have not seen before like one day i remember just sitting there and you could hear it sounded like rain coming in and then we realized wait a minute it's these crabs and there's these things called halloween moon crabs that are having a migration they're purple and orange and there's about ten thousand of them coming through the leaf litter of the jungle and it's just like this incredible noise and suddenly they were up every tree and all around us i mean some people would find it utterly horrific and terrifying but just that you have these moments that you would never normally witness um and then other days where we've had like these nesting um, we've had nesting turtles just a big loggerhead turtle pop up and, and laying its eggs next to us and just being able to watch that and and then having the young um coming out and, and uh, hatching and making their way down to the beach and swimming in phosphorescent plankton so for me like the nature is is a big part of it but but yeah just slowing down like we were saying as well, like that time without technology when you're all sat around the fire, it's a really 
it's a lovely time to connect with people and meet people. Like people share so much more. There's so much more vulnerability and they open up. And uh, and yeah, our castaways tend to be, they're just like a tight tribe by the end of it. There's that shared adversity of what they've done together. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone kind of gets on. Do you feel though, how long's the expeditions usually? It's eight days on the island. So that, uh, that eight days, you bonded together by going through the same experience, the shared experience and... You've just switched off from the outside world, so you're just connecting with each other. Do you think if it was an eight-month stint, that that strong bond, that tribe mentality, would eventually turn to a little bit more friction, or yeah, but the yeah. outside world stuff that we're used to now starts in being infiltrate, like infiltrating into the into the tribe. I think, I mean, yeah, I think there's a good chance that people would start to irritate each other, particularly if you like people get hang like hungry and, and tired as well. Oh, yeah. fuck. You're I right. It's probably that perfect that. amount of time that people have just, they've still got patience for each other. In fact, we've the only trips we've had where people really bicker is when they know each other before the expedition, like the private trips. Um, whereas if it's like all strangers, they, they tend to be yeah more patient with each other. Do they? Yeah. Well, I've got to do it on my own, mate. Okay, Joe. So if I'm not coming on your <coughs> expedition, who would be of any of the England teammates that you have had down the years in your long storied 80 something cap career which is yet to yield a single test point um which of those <laughs> which of those teammates would you most and least like to be marooned with on a desert island there's there's only one man for the job and he is both the most and the least person that I want to be on it with and it's Johnny May <laughs> he's I'd most want to because he'd actually be really efficient. He'd be he'd pragmatic about, right, this is what we've got to do. Very organised. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, and I'd enjoy his company and his, the quirks that he has. But fuck, the chicken noise that he does would probably grind on me early on. And just the constant winding up of me but I'd love it I think either way I actually want to go with him on an expedition now but talking of our pirate island on your islands that you've been have you ever had any trouble with locals or even pirates if not I don't mean like Blackbeard and that but yeah yeah we well it's one of the things we have to factor in when choosing an island like there's lots of islands that would look ideal on paper in the south china sea but there's still piracy obviously off somalia is a lot of piracy and yeah recently in panama last season in fact there was um a couple of incidents of piracy where people and their, their catamarans were being robbed um and so we we had an expedition coming up and we we were particularly worried about this and we had to get the local navy to do patrols of the island um, to make sure that we were safe. So, yeah, piracy is, is something we still have to consider. And there's also cartels running drugs in that part of the world as well. So some of the islands further south in the archipelago would be brilliant, but we're told that it's a bit too dangerous with narcos. So we, we stick a little further north in the uh, I mean, that would, change, that would change the whole experience of being marooned. There's an <laughs> island where someone goes, I found something! <coughs> oh. Square grouper. <laughs> what? Square grouper, they call it, when you find a bale of cocaine. Square grouper. Yeah. I used to live in Honduras for seven months when I was like 20. And um, I was talking to the boat driver. Who's, we were like mapping coral and stuff. And um, and I was like, I have for forgot his name, Pedro. Uh, I was like, Pedro, like, <laughs> you've got basically living in corrugated iron huts, but then they've got this huge satellite dish, massive TV and perfect basketball court. I was like, I mean, how do you do this? And like, well, now, Tom, every now and again, we don't just catch a normal grouper, we catch the square grouper. And they would get these bundles of cocaine that would, would rock up on their on their coastline and uh, and sell them and and it would go into the community. They would buy something for the local community. Community cocaine. Like community <laughs> cocaine, doing good. I literally thought, oh, so it's doing good for the community actually. I mean they get a bad rap in these cartels, but <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it out. What about oh. other stuff that's not uh, from the gift of nature, so I will tell them that you have found on desert islands. Um, I mean, it's depressing how much plastic, obviously, there really? is. Like, even the most remote islands in Tonga is still, I mean, I find hypodermic needles and, and things like this that everything will wash up. The coolest thing I found is much nicer. I found the uh, vertebrae of a whale. So it's about nearly two foot wide. 
um, this beautiful vertebrae. Um, yeah, that was the nicest thing I've ever found on the beach. Uh, did you manage to bring it back with you? We were just... fucking idiots. And we used it for cracking almonds on and then oh. broke it into. I don't understand how I could have done that. <laughs> and it really it kills me. We were me. fucking idiots for trying to survive but on this desert we island. Could have used rocks. Rather than taking it rocks. back. Oh, yeah. Oh, we yeah. could have used rocks. We were just, it was yeah, like, oh, that's there. It's like a footstool. Um, yeah, we, we find like cool things like. Um, I've never found ambergris. I really want to find, obviously, ambergris. The Sorry, what? Sperm whale vomits. What they make? Um, they make perfume from. It's unbelievable. So the ambergris. Yeah, they they sperm whales eat lots of giant squid, and the bills, the beaks of the giant squid, make like a ball effectively in their stomach. And then every like ten years or whatever, they'll vomit up this weird stinking ball. And somehow, I don't understand why, but this is a prime ingredient for perfume. And so, like, one kilo is worth more than gold. It's, like, hundreds of thousands of quid. And you find it washed up on remote beaches. I want amber grease. I want to go find this amber grease. So they're just... It's like the truffle whale, of the ocean. Whale sick. Yeah. Whale sick. Whale sick. <laughs> um, wrapping up now, Tom. Three items you're allowed to take on this desert island. Three. You've got to choose. What are you taking? Whoosh. Okay. Um, I'm taking this as a different question to the Desert Islandist luxury item. I'm seeing this survival, Tom, as essential items. So help me out here. Well, it's up to you, mate. Massive knife. Yeah. I don't go massive. I don't like the big hunting knives. Oh. I like I like something a bit smaller, personally. Okay. A, a, a nice small knife. Or a but... <laughs> <laughs> Why do you always go massive knife? They're so much harder to... Control. Oh, right. It's so obvious, is it? Sorry, it's yours. No, these are your items. All right. They're your items. I've got an excellent knife, which is really firmly attached to the handle, and it's some sort of unbelievable Sheffield steel, beautiful knife. That's number one. I'm getting a some sort of flint set, so I don't have to do the fire plough thing. Were you thinking fire plough? We've just been taught the fire plough. Are you thinking more like, do I want like a CD player or something? What's up to you, mate? It's three items. I'll tell you what I would like, actually. I'd like some way of recording my experience. You want to go on TV? No. Maybe either. I've got, like, an enormous notepad and a number of biros. I'm not going to run out so I can record my thoughts and experiences. Good, because you can use the biros for other things as well. Stabbing things. Once they run out of ink. Yep. Or maybe some sort of portable recording device so I can do an audio diary. Some way of recording my thoughts and experiences, Joe. About you. But what for? Like you're stuck on there. So why are you taking that? Because I'm an optimist. I don't believe I'm going to be stuck on there. No, but the conditions of this question are you're stuck on there. Forever. Yep. You ain't coming off, mate. So you're still going to record it? Maybe that would be a good cathartic method. Still good to journal, Jack. Our... Get things off your chest. Okay. What about you? Uh, why do I feel this is going to be totally different? No. I've put some thought into it. Metal detector. Okay, yeah. Uh, bing bing you know when you see yeah. like because you know, there'll be some fucking cool shit under there aside from all the shitty plastic and the whale vertebra like fucking gonna have some fun doing that uh, magnet fish fishing <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got one at home <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, re I'm ready I'm fucking ready I did have one of those uh, metal detectors but it ran out of battery uh, magnet fishing and then my, I've got a new set of knives, like a set. Like So there's a bread knife. Uh, That'd little, be useful. A little paring What do you mean? Where, where are you getting your bread from? Yeah, it's a serrated blade, Tom. Okay. So it helped me cut through wood better. Wouldn't it, survival, Tom? Yep. <laughs> Not sure, is he? Not sure. No, but I probably wouldn't take the knives because I'd be able to use the, the shells and that lot of the crabs that I eat to then sharpen. Um... What about a nice hoodie? A hoodie? Oh, actually, a pillow. <laughs> you said about sleep yeah, and being wanna, important. Yeah, you want to sleep well. You know, I'm yeah. sleep, sleep well, I'm taking a pillow. Mag, uh, magnet fishing, pillow, metal detector. Genius. Survival time, your three items, please. I mean, of course, we could. I could cheat a little bit and have a sat phone, a bloody oh, yeah. Winnebago. Uh, but as far as, like, kind of key kit... I mean, when I did the thing in Canada, I was allowed to choose 10 items. What, that thing in Canada, is that the TV Alone. show? Alone? Yeah. Talk us about that bit. So 
basically 10 people were dropped off in the middle of nowhere, no, um, separated from each other. So I was totally on my own, no film crew, just me and a camera. And I was allowed to take 10 items to help me survive as long as possible uh, in the wild. So, And what were your 10 items? Do you remember them? My 10 items were a axe, a saw, a multi-tool, like mm. a leatherman, um, a, a cast iron cooking pot. A, cast iron? Surely it's too heavy. Oh, but heavy was fine. It was oh. like heavy. It didn't, You're strong enough. Yeah. I didn't really. I only had to carry it about 10 meters to the river and back. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I took a uh, fishing kit, which is just some line and 25 hooks. I took a fishing net, a uh, paracord, which is rope, basically, um, and some snare wire. Oh, and a sleeping bag. Fucking hell, you're well kitted. I out. know. No wonder you survived. Generous you, and you won it. Yeah, I won it. What the fuck did everyone else take then? I mean, they basically, everyone took it pretty much exactly the same. I, I, one person took a bow and arrow instead of a fishing net. I wish I'd done that in hindsight. Really? There were grouse everywhere. I didn't back myself as a bow hunter because I'd only done like one day training. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm never going to get within 20 meters of a deer. Uh, I'm delusional to think that. But there were these grouse just everywhere. I could have I could have easily nailed like 10 of them. I did accidentally catch a duck in my net though on day 25 and I'd just eaten pike and leaves and berries for 25 days and then I ate this duck and like roast duck is my favorite food in the normal world but when you eat roast duck when all you've eaten is that oh my god it was the most incredible meal of my life like like you're already your senses are so heightened you know you smell more you hear more you see more but then when you eat something that has all these trace minerals and fats and salts that your body hasn't had for like nearly a month, it was honestly like, I don't know, the hunger is the best source. Like it was like a triple Michelin star experience. It was just, I was weeping into my bowl as I ate this thing. I was like, I'll only eat half and save it tomorrow. Fuck no. I just <laughs> devoured this whole thing. It was fucking amazing. Like, Tom, are you sitting there going, how the fuck could you eat a duck? No, I've, I mean, I've been vegetarian now for pretty much 30 years. And that duck sounds absolutely delicious. <laughs> So eating Joe is a bit more challenging as a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. I want to come on one of these expeditions. I'd love to have you. Do so it. how can I go about booking that? Yeah. So you can go to desertislandsurvival.com and uh, and yeah, choose your destination. And out of all the islands you've got, what's what's the best one? What's what's your favourite? I mean Tonga is if you if you don't care about the travel time, because it is like forty hours to get there yeah. from here, Tonga is sensational. Uh, we swim with humpback whales mm -hmm. on the first day, which is which is magical. And uh What do you mean you swim with them? You, yeah, you, you the, the their mothers are are nursing their young. They give birth to their young and nurse them. And so you can get in the water and you can swim with the mother and the calf. I just did it in July and the the mother kind of keeps its distance, but the calf is like a three ton puppy and it just swims up to us. It's like two weeks old and it's like, look at me, I've got these fins. And I thought it was going to go straight into me. Um, but honestly, it was a mind blowing experience. Um, so yeah, we go we... do that, Tom? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fucking go yes, there. Yes, I do. And they talk. Uh, yeah. So we, when we go snorkeling as well, you go down, hold onto a rock and you can hear them. You can hear, you can hear them. Which is really nice. <laughs> he speaks wild. I would fucking love that. It sounds incredible. It's, what you're doing just sounds brilliant. Oh, thanks. Brilliant fun, but also the things that you've touched on through this episode is quite powerful as well. Yeah. For uh, the mind and the soul by the sounds of it. We've had, um, I never set it up as transformational travel or any of this, but we've had like quite a lot of people have epiphanies. And I, I often say like, it's the first time they've got off the hamster wheel of life and they've stopped and looked around and gone, why the fuck am I doing that job I don't like? Or I'm on with that person that I don't, uh, doesn't really value me or whatever. And we've had people leave their job, leave their partner. I had one woman, she'd never left New Zealand before. She came on the trip and uh, cause her friend was like, do this. And now she, she she was about 250 pounds weight. She's like lost half her body weight. She now runs marathons and she travels the world. Like it just completely changed her. Mm. Um, so it can be like impactful for people. I survival Tom only been looking at me when <laughs> <laughs> describing <laughs> that transformation of that person from 250 pounds to 180 or something. Why wasn't he looking at you? Let's then? not end on a negative joke. <laughs> It's been a hugely enjoyable episode. Survival, Tom, thank you so much. Thank you. I don't feel like I've talked much about survival. <laughs> yeah. but, um, You've been but brilliant, yeah, mate. Thank you. Great I've really fun. enjoyed it. It's been thank lovely. you so much. Cheers. Cheers.